All right, we are live. And I should say, well, for me, it's good afternoon. I think for Justine and Dr. Grubb, it's also good afternoon. But where That's are you yeah. logging in from? Maybe good morning, maybe good evening, but definitely welcome to today's Vet Girl YouTube Live. Very excited to have all of you with us today. We'll get into this a little bit more, but thank you to Alenko for being an amazing educational partner and allowing us to um, have Dr. Grubb here to give us important information. For those of you that have been on our YouTube lives before, again, welcome. We love to start as people are logging on, maybe grabbing their granola bar between cases and finding out where you're from. I'll start out. My name is Garrett Pactinger. I'm a critical care specialist and the co-founder of Vet Girl. I'm logging in, as you can see from my windows behind me, from sunny Pennsylvania and unseasonably warm Pennsylvania. It's like 86 degrees. Um, I guess we're not going to get a winter this year, unlike Justine in Minnesota. But I'm uh, excited to have you all here. Justine, I kind of spoiled it, but where are you logging in from? No problem. I am logging in from St. Paul, Minnesota, and we had a record 80 inches of snow this year. We usually get like 50, so that's pretty good for us. But it's a beautiful 75 degree day, so I will take it. <laughs> Dr. Grubb, what about you? Where are you logging in from? I'm in the state of Washington, so it is a good morning still good for morning. me. <laughs> Just barely still morning, but we're having a lovely spring day, so happy to have it. Not to seems brag. Like, uh, seems like that unseasonable warmness is coming through and uh, getting a little sense of spring and makes me want to get out there and barbecue. I'll tell you that much. It's, uh, <laughs> my, my summer fun is getting out there. But uh, as we said, where we're logging in from, where are you logging in from? We love to see it. So if you can please type in that comment or question screener, Sarah's in Illinois. Welcome, Sarah. Um, but again, please Type in where you're logging in from. We love to see it. We know we have our 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 sort of family and vet girl family and friends from all over, not only the country or North America, but the world. We have coming in now Texas, New Jersey. Oh, amazing. Uh, let's see here. Vancouver, Canada, Chicago. I did promise Dr. Grubb this would truly be an amazing international audience. So don't prove me wrong. Type in where you're coming from. Let's see. New Hampshire, Connecticut, it continues to come. But as you're typing in where everything is coming from, we're going to, where you are coming from, we're going to get moving uh, to make this a, a great webinar and get started. And we're going to be talking about what cats want to know, want us to know about acute pain. So let's get started again. Thank you so much to Alenko for being here with us today and being an amazing educational partner. We've always promised that when we have an amazing educational partner like Alenko, we're super happy to provide amazing education, com completely free, complimentary to the veterinary world. So again, thank you to Alenko. Now, super, super important. How are you going to get your race approved CE from this session? There are two ways. And again, we're going to keep this open, like always, for 30 minutes after the conclusion. So it will end at 2 p.m. Eastern time as this goes from 1 to 1.30 Eastern. We're going to close down this attendance page at 2 p.m. Eastern. No ifs, ands, or buts because we got to get our CE uploaded and approved. Two ways. One is you can use your fancy smartphone. Go ahead and use that camera feature. And if you use your camera feature, point it at that QR code. You're going to get a little link that comes up and it's going to bring you to a form to fill out. That same form is using that website address, tinyurl.com forward slash VG for Vet Girl and today's date, 41323. Those are your two ways. Justine will later on put it in the comment feed below so you have the link as well. I'll mention this one more time at the end of the webinar, but this is the only way to get your CE. Fill out this form by using either the QR code or that website address by 2 p.m. Eastern today. And by 3 o'clock Eastern, I'll have your CE uploaded into your CE certificate account. Please use your Vet Girl associated email to do so. All right couple of more housekeeping issues. As this is on YouTube, if you don't want it to be that small little thing on your screen, click that open box in the bottom corner. It will make it full screen for you. So you see all of us in 4K HD. You may not want to. I get it. But that's the way to do it. If you're new to Vet Girl, we have so much to offer to provide amazing education to the veterinary community. We do webinars, podcasts, blogs, videos, our certificate programs, as you see on the right side of the screen, our message board. We provide anywhere from 150 to 200 hours of new CE each and every year. Plus, as a Vet Girl member, you get access to thousands of hours of Vet Girl content in our on-demand libraries. You can learn 
at your convenience 24 7 365 and with that said I would be remiss if I did not mention our annual conference this year, Vecural U, which is August 10th through 13th at the amazing Fairmont Scottsdale, Fairmont Princess in Scottsdale in Arizona. If you've not been before, this is a luxury resort. I think there's six pools. It's absolutely amazing. I've had the pleasure of being there twice and I can't wait to go back. So don't have FOMO. You don't want the summer to end and hear about your colleagues' amazing, amazing bougie vet girl experience my spa in the u.s it is bougie i love it so please sign up it's super awesome we give amazing ted talk like lectures we have a lot of fun you're wined and dined and treated as veterinary professionals should be treated so sign up because i don't want you to have that regret that fomo for missing out this amazing conference with that said Let's get to today's lecture and lecturer. We have the amazing Dr. Tammy Grubb with us. She is awesome. Dr. Grubb, I'm gonna pass the mic virtually over to you. Justine and I are gonna get out of here, at least we're gonna become invisible for a little bit. If you can give our audience a little bit of an introduction of who you are, what you're doing right now, and then take it away, the floor will be yours. We will be behind the scenes the entire time. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks back. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Justine. So good to be with with that girl. As always, you guys have an amazing platform. Love working with you. And I also want to shout out thanks to Alanco for giving us this opportunity. I am, as Garrett said, Dr. Grubb. I am Dr. Tammy Grubb. I'm an anesthesiologist and I have a huge interest in pain management. I've got one foot in academia, one foot in private practice, but my real passion right now is I am president-elect of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. So very, very, very exciting. All right, thanks to you guys for joining me to talk about acute pain in cats, one of my, my favorite things. And we've said that this is sponsored by Alanco, and I'll be honest with you guys, I'll talk to anybody that even thinks about anesthesia and analgesia products. I wanna know everything. Part of that is selfish, but part of it is to bring you a fair and balanced presentation so that we cover everything. And we are talking about three Alanco drugs today, but there is no conflict because they are unique in their classes, either in duration of action or FDA approved duration for administration. So let's get started. The first thing cats want us to know, now I want you to be the cat for the next 20 minutes. Uh, sorry, but please be the cat in pain, right? So you're a cat and you have pain. What do you want me to know as a human? And the first thing the cat wants us to know is, of course, they feel pain. They're mammals. And let's look at that in the next slide. Scientifically, we can prove that they feel pain because the mammalian pain pathway is the same. It's very, very similar. We call it well-preserved across all species. So we have neuro... We have we have pain receptors, we have neurotransmitters, we have projection tracks, transmission up to the spinal cord, and then a projection track up to the brain. We have areas in the brain that recognize pain. We all have the same thing. So if something is painful to a human, it is painful to a cat without question. Let's look at the next slide because here's the next thing they want us to know. Why do some people think cats don't feel pain because they are the masters at hiding it, right? Be the cat again. I'm not gonna show you any pain. In the next slide, we'll see why. Because it's survival, right? Evolutionarily, they are in a prey predator world. And because cats are smaller, they're often the prey and here comes the predator, right? And that predator causes pain. And so you run away from the predator and then you hide that pain made sure that you survived because you ran away. So if the cat can't run, like living in a house, it has to hide. So really they are good at this because they think they need to do this to live. We'll talk about that more in just a bit. Cats also want us to know that maybe their pain is worse than our pain. And, and what is, how could that be? Because I just said it was the same and now I'm saying maybe it's different. But the, the pathophysiology is the same, but the impact on the cat might be worse. Let me show you that in the next slide. Because cats can't understand time. 
So when we are in pain, we can say, I'll be better tomorrow. Or if I take an inset, it will go away or whatever it is that helps us modify our thought about this pain. But to our knowledge, animals can't do that. They only know pain in the moment. And yes, they can sort of figure out what time we come home from work, but they can't predict that tomorrow or the next day. They just do that. Okay, the sun's starting to come down. Mom should drive up in her car any minute, right? But knowing that tomorrow our pain will be better, we don't think they know that. So can you imagine right now you're the cat and you have this horrific sensation that you don't understand. You don't even know what pain is. You just know it's horrific and you don't know that it will be better tomorrow. So we think it could actually be worse for them. Here the cat wants us to know my, my pain causes me fear, anxiety, and stress. And then the pain gets worse. Let's dig into that deeper. We know that pain can cause fear, anxiety, and stress, right? Probably anybody that's been in pain might have had a little bit of anxiety that you might not be able to be as mobile as you wanted to, your headache might not go away. And did you know that that fear, anxiety, and stress makes the pain worse? So when we have patients with high anxiety or fear, like cats, we need to treat both pain and that fear, anxiety, and stress. Cats also want us to know these four things. Pain hurts, pain impacts my health, pain decreases my welfare and my quality of life, and pain makes me not a very nice member of the family. Let's dig into that. So here we have the facial grimace scale used for children to indicate how much pain they are in. That's at the top. And at the bottom, you see that feline grimace scale that I hope we're all using. And for just a moment, make yourself the cat Make yourself the cat or make yourself that number five in the, the pain grimace scale for people. How much pain would it take to make you make that pain face? Just think about it. Be the cat. How much pain? And then go to the bottom, that corresponding cat face. Now you really are the cat, right? That cat feels that same amount of pain. Let's look at the next thing. What is pain doing to my health? Let's look at that in a chart here. So you see that pain is a tremendous stressor and as a stressor, pain negatively impacts the sympathetic nervous system. So we get things like tachycardia and hypertension that is bad for every cat, but certainly worse for a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for instance. We get increased glucose release, tachypnea, delayed healing, all that cortisol floating around, catabolism, our patients aren't healing well. Let's look at the next thing. So what does pain do about how the cat feels about us? How do you think that cat, look at the cat's face. How do you think he feels? That cat is not happy, right? And I wanted to get back to hiding under the bed. We hear owners all the time say, my cat hid under the bed. I think it's mad at me. We need to tell owners the cat's not mad. The cat's afraid, right? It's already in pain, and then every time we pet it or drag it out from under the bed to give it a pill, that causes more pain. So remember again, this is a survival mechanism, but a cat hiding under the bed is not very good for the human-animal bond. And we all know how bonded we are to our pets, and we want our owners to be equally as bonded because that's what gets them to bring the pet in for vet care. All right, what else might happen if we don't prevent or treat the pain? Let's look at that. Because it's not just pain at the moment. It actually is well known that if we are ineffective at controlling acute pain, that might lead to chronic pain, really. If we're not good at managing surgical pain, we might set that patient up for what we call chronic post-surgical pain that can last for months to years to life. This is very well documented in human medicine and becoming more and more documented in veterinary medicine. So how are we going to prevent the pain then? As Kitty says, that's what I want. Let's dig into how. And first I want to give you two open access papers. This one on guidelines on the management of acute pain in cats. And the next one, the AHA pain management guidelines for dogs and cats. I know the other species in there, but cats are there. They're okay. Both of these are open access and we'll give you some more information so that when we're done here, you don't have to be done. All right, let's dig into that, that second paper, the AHA paper that has this great figure in it, figure three, which is a treatment 
a flow chart for acute and chronic pain. And the drugs are tier one, those are the, the most effective treatments. Tier two, okay. Tier three, eh, you can try them if nothing works. You can see that tier one drugs for acute pain in both dogs and cats are non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, opioids, and local anesthetics. Let's dig into that. So, first, anti inflammatory drugs. The kitty says, hey, inflammation keeps the pain going and spreading. And think how painful a paper cut is. Can you imagine how painful incisions feel? Let's talk more about NSAIDs here. Remember, they are not contraindicated in cats for relief of acute pain. And in fact, two of them are FDA approved in cats. The benefits of controlling inflammation, obviously we're decreasing pain. You're probably going, duh, we knew that. <laughs> That's why we're giving them. But just think, in addition to decreasing the pain, we're decreasing the inflammation. And probably again, you're thinking, Duh, that's why they're called anti-inflammatory drugs. But just think about that. We're decreasing the pain. At the same time, we're decreasing the cause of the pain. That's very powerful to be bringing them down together. And that decreases the likelihood that the patient would experience peripheral sensitization, which is that upregulation or amplification of the pain in the periphery that can lead to central sensitization, which really amplifies that pain. Opioids, two FDA approved opioids in cats, but we need to know that cats are not small dogs. Let's talk about that more in the next slide. Cats have a different behavioral response to opioids. Owners are very used to their dogs coming home and not being very active after surgery, maybe wanting to sleep a little more. Remember that cat and dogs get sedated a little bit, cats get euphoric. And so it's important to remember to tell owners now that we're sending home more of these longer lasting opioids, that what they might see from their kitty at home is a little bit of increased activity, wanting to play with that mouse, unlike the dog who wants to sleep. So it's just an opioid effect. The second one is to remember to tell owners that cats may get uh, pupillary dilation from opioids. And sometimes that, that makes them very, very concerned because they're, we get the calls a lot the, from opioids or from anticholinergics. I think the anesthesia is still impacting my pet, doc. His eyes are big. So that can be a concern for cat owners. We, we need to remember to tell them it's just the opioid. It's fine, but let's look at the next slide. We also need to tell them that the cat might have a little bit of blurred vision when their pupils are dilated, right? It happens to us, obviously it must happen to them. And so they shouldn't startle their cat as they're walking up to their cat, speak to their cat. So the cat knows it's them and not just something moving towards them that they don't understand. And honestly, that's how we should treat our cats anyway. Be respectful, talk to them. And also tell the owners they might have a little bit of photophobia and so might avoid bright lights for just a little bit after receiving that opioid. So now local anesthetics and the kitty says, when the nerve is blocked, I don't feel pain, at least from the nerve blocked, it is blocked. And the, here's our cheerleading from the kitty, block it every kitty, every time. I agree. And there is one FDA approved local anesthetic in cats. Now, just think about how powerful these local anesthetics are, and they are not contraindicated in cats. We do need to use the cat dose, but we have these four phases of the pain pathway we looked at, and all of them are super complicated, except for transmission. And in transmission, primarily the painful impulse can only get to the central nervous system by opening of sodium channels. And on the next slide, we'll see how local anesthetics work. Remember, they block sodium channels. That's a superpower in pain relief. All right, let's go to the, this one, please. The kitties are saying use pain scores because we've said they hide pain, but they really do have pain. So let's look at pain scoring. And you've already seen this one. It's my favorite one, the feline grimace scale. Feline grimace scale focuses on the position of the eyes and the ears and the whiskers. 
and it is super easy to implement in your practices. I mean, you can look at those cats' faces, and this is all open access. Please download this feline grimace scale and the training manual and get going in your practice. You can totally do this in everybody's practice. So now the kitty brings up a really good point that we all need to focus on, and that is the kitty needs something for post-operative pain, which is often a gap. We don't always control that post-operative pain, and we need to, and I'm going to show you why in the next slide, and that is because we talked about that chronic post-surgical pain that can develop. The biggest predictor and contributor to development of chronic post-surgical pain is intense and prolonged pain in recovery. And when I say recovery, I don't mean recovery from anesthesia. I mean recovery from the surgery, right? So yes, immediately after the surgery. And then three days, seven, 14, however long it takes for that surgical incision to heal. So we need to treat the kitties, but everybody knows this. Be the kitty and have some pills shoved down your throat. Are you happy? Not happy. Let's go to the next slide. Ta-da-da, yay. Here's some drugs to the rescue. We have a local anesthetic that lasts 72 hours that we would administer in the hospital. We have an opioid that lasts four days that we would administer in the hospital. We have an NSAID that we can dose for three days that will start in the hospital. And let's look deeper at that NSAID. So this is Onsior or Robinococcid. We know that we can give a dose in hospital. I usually use the injectable. The owner then does have to give two doses at home. So two pills at home, but that's it, only two. Now on the next slide, we just need to remind ourselves to think about safety of every drug. If we talk about efficacy, we should talk about safety. And no, you don't need to read this. This is available as a product insert when you buy the drug and also on the Elanco website. But just as an example, typical safety information for an NSAID, if the cat stops eating or gets lethargic, we need the owner to stop giving the NSAID and bring the cat back in. Let's look at the next drug, buprenorphine for cats. This is the really new Zorbium. It is applied transdermally dermally, <laughs> and really does provide four days of pain relief for cats. We apply it in hospital. Now, when we talk about safety information, we have two cohorts, the cat and the human, right? We know the drug is efficacious. It's buprenorphine. But let's look at safety for cats. And again, this is available on the Elanco website and very typical for safety information for opioids. For instance, we should be checking body temperatures in cats when we get any opioid. In the next slide, we're going to talk about safety in humans. We do not want to be exposed to opioids. So when you're administering this drug, wear gloves, get the tube right down to the skin, the cat's skin at the base of the neck, and then expel the content of that tube. That dries within 30 minutes. Now remember, you can apply that to the base of the neck. You can pet the cat anywhere, anywhere, other than the base of the neck for 30 minutes. But we know from safety studies that in 30 minutes it's dry and you have no danger then of contacting that opioid. In the next slide, we're talking about Noceta. Remember that is liposome encapsulated bupivacaine, provides 72 hours of superpower pain relief, and it is FDA approved for both dogs and cats. Let's look at the safety of Noceta. Again, efficacy, we got to look at safety. And this is a very typical safety profile or safety information for most drugs in that Noceta hasn't been tested in all of our patients. For instance, not in lactating or pregnant patients. So that gave us awesome pain relief. And I know I went through that quickly, but I think the cat wanted you to know all of that with enough time left over for some question and answer. So the kitty is ready to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. We do have a bunch of questions. You know, a lot of people are still getting used to the grimace scale. So I think that's great information. Now, in terms of um, delivering pain medication and anesthetic monitoring, how soon do you give some of these post-op pain medications 
just in case it affects your monitoring? Ooh, very, very good question. Thanks for putting those together. You know, it's a little bit multifaceted answer because we need to think about two things. And one is the duration of the drug from the first administration, right? We don't want the drug to wear off. We want to make sure we have a continuum of pain relief or else that pain pathway gets upregulated. So part of it is really based on pharmacology and not the cat. And then the part that is focused on the cat is really just to remember what would that drug do to the monitoring. I'm still going to give an opioid if that previous opioid is wearing off, but I know that the opioid might cause a little bit of bradycardia, right? Might doesn't cause respiratory depression so much in our patients, but might slow the rate just a little bit. So if that happens and I know that that's what the drug causes, perfectly comfortable with my monitoring. So know those two things, duration of the drug, and effect of the drug. Wonderful, thank you. Now, uh, just a reminder, in case you didn't hear the very beginning, please make sure to fill out the form that I just put into the chat. This form will close in about 30 minutes. It's designed for you to fill it out so you get your CE certificate. So make sure you log, you use your email address for your trial or free membership for Vet Girl because you need to be able to find your CE certificate directly there. So again, that form will close out in 30 minutes. So make sure to fill that out. And again, a huge thank you to Alenco for sponsoring this. I know we've had a ton of questions when it comes to pain management and not everyone recognizes that grimace scale. So really, really important. Any information that you tell pet owners in terms of uh, with transdermal, what to do, what to look for um, in terms of really applying that grimace scale to like a pet owner, a cat owner friendly, um, I don't want to say spiel, but like, what do you tell them exactly? We tell them all the things we talked about that first of all, your cat may be a little bit more playful um, and it may not want to be in bright light. So as long as its other behaviors are normal, the way it interacts with you, that it's eating, all that kind of stuff, then it's an opioid effect. So we want them to be prepared for that. And then about pain relief, we tell them, you know, the usual. We often, if they're painful, we notice a change in behavior as in hiding, not playing more, but hiding or maybe being off their food a little bit. We want them to be eating by the next day and so to watch for changes in behavior. And then what's super cool about the feline grimace scale is there's an app for that. And there's an app, and I don't know the, the, the address, sorry about that, but there's an app that owners can use on their phone and it has been validated by the people who first validated the feline grimace scale. Super easy for owners to use. So I encourage owners to download that. Wonderful. And I'll make sure to uh, drop that into the chat where you can get the okay. app directly. All right. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, again, make sure to fill out the form. Um, do you mind uh, one question? Do you, can you repeat the info on the transdermal buprenorphine? Yeah, absolutely. So the transdermal buprenorphine, it's called Zorbium. And oh, yeah, thank you. Magic. <laughs> we put it right on the skin at the base of the neck. And it lasts for four days. Now, one thing to think about is incorporating this into your anesthetic protocol or analgesic protocol. It takes about one to two hours for full onset. That's not a big deal, right? Buprenorphine is not our fastest opioid, so not a surprise. And anytime we apply something transdermal, it takes a little bit of time. So it's just, it's just pharmacokinetics. So be sure you put it on board in time for that drug to be working. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Fantastic information. I don't see any other questions coming in, but again, just wanted to thank you, Dr. Grubb. Always love lecturing. I always love hearing you lecture because you make it so clinically relevant. And again, a huge thank you to Alenko. I also wanted to thank all of you guys. I know everyone's still super busy. Uh, this COVID thing is never going to end in terms of caseload for us as veterinarians and veterinary technicians. So thank you for all that you guys do. I hope you're able to get some really important information out of this directly during your lunchtime or coffee break or whenever you're able to learn. And we will plan on seeing you at the next Vet Girl webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Grubb. Thanks, Beck. Always great to work with you guys and appreciate also Lanco and the audience. We know time is limited, so appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Take care.